So good morning. Uh, welcome to this event looking at continued relig religious persecution in Algeria. I'll try not to step on the Zoom lead. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, not just because this is a, a critical topic, with Algeria seeing increased persecution of religious minorities, uh, Christians, Protestants, Evangelicals, along as Ahmadiyyas, and um, other Muslim minorities in the country. Uh, we have seen a vast, vast increase of lockdowns and uh, arrests of uh, religious leaders, crackdowns on people's rights to protest, people's rights for freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and ultimately uh, many, many closures of places of worship. So today, this is a, a really important panel to be looking at this topic. And again, it's a really important time to be doing this as we, as we do this now. We have the UK's largest international ministerial conference this year meeting uh, a couple of hundred metres away in the QET where we have representatives from more than 80 countries <coughs> around the world discussing this very important topic. As many of my panelists are aware and will we'll share that um, freedom of religion or belief is, is a core right, it underpins all other freedoms in society and it is a really strong indicator of where a country is going. When religious minorities are oppressed, when they are targeted, often we see this targeting and this uh, oppression spreading to other groups within the country. It's often a first indicator. And in Algeria, uh, all too sadly, we have seen um, this first indicator prove uh, time and time again that um, uh, this repression of religious minorities has <coughs> spread to, to many, many other areas of society. I want to pass on uh, greetings from Jim Shannon, who's the chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Freedom of Religion and Belief. He is currently in a debate at the moment, so can't be with us. And again, greetings from Fiona Bruce, who is uh, the UK Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion and Belief, who is speaking at the conference at the moment. I am a uh, member of the Secretariat of the APG4. We are a group of 160 parliamentarians in the UK who are passionate about raising these issues, about empowering uh, people who, who are experts in these areas who can speak from uh, authority, through personal experience or through <coughs> research, and then impacting that on policy. So without further ado, I will hand over, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for your introduction, and uh, welcome to you all being here on this uh, side event of the big conference uh, just across the street, as was mentioned. I just came from there and uh, we were uh, spoken to by His Royal Highness Prince Charles, uh, who stressed the importance, importance of uh, FORB um, uh, in the UK, but especially, of course, uh, worldwide. And he was um, sharing uh, that we were at the crossroads of uh, liberal countries or uh, dictatorial uh, countries at the moment, and we have the responsibility to address these uh, fundamental totalitarian regimes on the human rights which they also uh, underscribed. So very welcome, uh, my name is Joe Vorderwind, I was a former member of the Dutch parliament uh, for 15 years, part of the coalition, we're still in the coalition and uh, I'm, I'm being an advocate now for freedom of religion uh, with different groups uh, going through different conferences um, and besides that, I'm also working for different NGOs, working on refugee and refugee care. So, this morning, uh, we'll talk about Algeria. Um, and uh, Algeria, the situation there of the minorities, especially religious minorities, are uh, decreasing at the moment. Uh, we saw that 16 uh, churches, at least 16 churches, were closed down, and another 10 um, are at the uh, risk of being closed at the moment. So we see a breakdown from 2017 in Algeria um, uh, for the religious minorities. Uh, also in 2020, 2021, we saw uh, the Algerian Christians, but also the Ahmadi uh, Muslim community uh, being under attack. And uh, a couple of people were, back, uh, in fact, uh, also uh, convicted because of blasphemy or evangelism. So uh, these are very worrying uh, situations that are happening at the moment. Um, so 
Algeria will be on the uh, Universal peri Period Review uh, this year, so it's an important moment to address Algeria. They will probably advocate their respect for human rights, which is nice, but uh, uh, I think we as an international community and NGOs, but also hopefully governments, will also address Algeria, Algeria um, on their um, uh, respect for religious minorities. That's why we're having this side event. So I'm honored to have this uh, distinguished panel with me, all specialists on Forb and some even on Algeria. Uh, so uh, let's start and introduce the first speaker, Jennifer Trigel, who is replacing uh, Ahmed Shaid, my good friend, which I worked with a lot uh, lately. And uh, uh, he couldn't be here, so he apologizes. He has COVID at the moment, so we were very happy that uh, Jennifer could replace him. And uh, I think she's doing more than a replacement because she knows a lot about Forb. So first, the floor to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Jennifer, as was just introduced, and I'm the Senior Legal Advisor to the Special Rapporteur. And it's a real pleasure to be with you today to speak to a room of human rights defenders, people who are really working on the ground to try and further freedom of religion or belief in Algeria and around the world. The mandate of the Special Rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief has a long-standing and continuing engagement with the situation in Algeria. In fact, it was subject to a visit from a previous Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief back in September 2002. And unfortunately, a number of the issues that were raised in that visit have continued until this day. Progress in some regards, but continuing concerns in others. And the immediate Special Rapporteur, my boss, Dr. Armin Shahid, he has also issued a number of communications over the years, which highlight particular issues within the country. And communications, for those who are not familiar with the UN human rights system, are a mechanism for individuals to contact the special rapporteur and have him make an intervention to the state who is accused of these human rights violations and really highlight the issue, raise it on the international stage, and then there is a permanent record of that complaint within the UN human rights system. One area of concern that has emerged in recent years is the amendment to the constitutional framework within Algeria in 2020. Dr. Shahid's mandate is for freedom of religion or belief. And in November 2020, there was an amendment to the constitution to make it purely about religion and not the belief part. And the ability to have uh, a belief means that the right protects those who may not choose to have one of the Abrahamic or other more widespread religions. And indeed, it also protects those who decide not to have a religion, atheists, agnostics, and so on. And while removing the right from the constitution does not in any way affect Algeria's international obligations to respect and uphold freedom <coughs> of religion or belief, it may make it more difficult within the country. And such legislative changes also reflect uh, maybe certain prevailing attitudes when it comes to tolerance of different religious or belief communities. The Special Rapporteur has also consistently called for the repeal of anti-blasphemy and anti-apostasy laws, noting that freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression are distinct but mutually enforcing rights. If you have freedom of expression, then that is fundamental for enjoying so many other rights, such as the right to seek a remedy, and also in expressing yourself in holding states as duty bearers to account. And the two rights, in many ways, speak to the multifaceted nature of human expression as a vehicle for exploring and developing your opinions, articulating your thoughts, searching for truth, and manifesting one's belief, whether individually or in community with others. And the importance of these rights is really shown within the human rights framework because both of these rights have an aspect called the form internum which means that they are deep, 
deeply held beliefs and within one's body, one's soul, that cannot be restricted under any circumstances. And only when there are particular manifestations of these rights, such as going to a place of, of religious worship or, or speech, can they be limited in very narrow circumstances. There's a number of international instruments, including the Rabat Plan of Action and, its 18, and the 18 Commitments of the Faith Right Framework, which call upon <coughs> states that still have blasphemy or anti-apostasy laws to repeal them, stressing that such laws stifle freedom of thought, conscience, religion or belief, and they also have a limiting effect on healthy dialogue and debate about freedom of religion or belief issues. And the Special Rapporteur has, in recent years, indeed in November and August 2021, issued a number of communications highlighting his concern over blasphemy convictions within Algeria for allegedly causing offence to Islam. And as a state party of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Algeria has these fundamental obligations to uphold not only freedom of religion or belief, but the whole suite of human rights, including freedom of expression and non-discrimination for members of all faith communities and none. Another issue of concern that has been raised to the Special, special Rapporteur has been that of registration requirements. States have sometimes used onerous, time-consuming registration requirements to try and limit the ability of communities to manifest their religion or belief. But within the human rights system, there is no registration requirement to have the right to freedom of religion or belief or to manifest it. It is often imposed as a hurdle to further marginalise certain communities. And indeed, there was a communication that Dr. Sheet issued in 2018 and another one in 2020 from the Protestant minority in Algeria, expressing their concern at their inability, their hurdles that they're facing when it comes to having the state recognise and register their community. To conclude, as my learner colleague introduced, the Universal Periodic Review is fast coming up for Algeria, and this is a tremendous opportunity for civil society actors to get involved and to make a submission <coughs> about the human rights record of Algeria, including freedom of religion or belief. But looking beyond that, uh, if individuals want to make submissions to the Special Rapporteur to, so that he can issue a communication to the government of Nigeria, that is always an avenue that is available. Ahmed Shahid is finishing his term as Special Rapporteur in the next couple of months, but his predecessor will undoubtedly be equally qualified and committed to promoting freedom of religion or belief in Algeria and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Dr. Ahmed Shahid. Uh, hopefully he hears it through you for being such an advocate, uh, a radical advocate for this uh, freedom of relief. And uh, good to hear that all the things that you and Dr. Shaid did for Algeria, especially also for the problems they have there facing registration of churches, but also for the Ahmadi community. So thanks for briefing us and uh, greet, and uh, hopefully you'll get better soon. Um, then we'll go to the next speaker, Daniel Hoffman. He is a fellow Dutchman, so we can speak in Dutch uh, with each other. We won't do, but uh, on the other hand, he hasn't been to the Netherlands for many years, so he's been a little bit uh, far from the Netherlands, but uh, he has been a big defender of for uh, with his organization, Middle East Concern, uh, and he has uh, also been active, his organization, on Al Algeria. That's why he's one of the speakers today. Um, he is... Um, um, See, he is now uh, supporting, of course, Millie is now supporting uh, individual patients, but next to that, they're also uh, doing training uh, of community leaders and constitutional rights. And so I'll give Daniel the floor to you. Thank you very much. And it's still always nice to see a fellow Dutchman, yeah. even though I've been away uh, for more than 20 years. 
Um, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to be here and organizing this important event on freedom of religion and belief in Algeria, which at the moment is uh, in a very problematic state, as uh, has already been mentioned before, and I'm sure every speaker after me uh, will agree with that uh, as well. An important uh, uh, moment or an important development in the status of freedom of religion and belief in Algeria was 2006 when the government issued an ordinance, so-called Ordinance 0603, which regulates the uh, religious worship of non-Muslim communities. In the title it says it regulates it, but in practice it puts a lot of restrictions on the freedom of, uh, to worship and the freedom of religion and belief of non-Muslim uh, religious communities. Uh, among one of the most important uh, stipulations of the ordinance is that non-Muslim religious worship can only happen in places that have received a special license from a national commission uh, to use that building for non-Muslim religious worship. And um, that commission has never issued a single license. And another important or very restrictive uh, stipulation is that the um, ordinance forbids and criminalizes the shaking of the faith of a Muslim without further defining what that means and what would be considered or what would qualify as shaking the faith of a Muslim. And since then, since 2006, uh, there have been several waves of pressure uh, on the Christian communities and I'm sure the Ahmadiyya communities and other communities uh, as well. And so there is a period where the government uh, cracks down very harshly on non-Muslim religious communities and then there is pressure from abroad and the government uh, relents in some of their pressures on the communities only to uh, restart the cycle again a few years later by cracking down on the communities. And at the moment, um, at least for the Protestant Christian communities, uh, we are in the middle of probably the worst cycle of repression of the Protestant Christian community in Algeria. Uh, the moderator already mentioned in the beginning, 16 places of worship has been sealed by the authorities and at least 10 more have been either forced to cease their activities or told that they will be closed in the very near future. And that's almost half of the Protestant places of worship in Algeria. Uh, more than 12 individual Christians have been prosecuted uh, either for trying to shake the faith of a Muslim uh, under Ordinance 0603, or for organizing religious worship without a permit, again under the same ordinance, or for blasphemy under the penal code. And one other uh, big problem for the Protestant uh, churches is that their registration with the government of their umbrella organization, the EPA, the Église Protestante d'Algérie, um, has not been accepted by the government. They were registered before 2012, there was a change in the law of associations and the government so far has refused to renew their registration. So those are three important problems and again, I, I'm sure speakers after me will give more examples and uh, discuss those things in more detail. Uh, three main problems, the closure of places of worship, the prosecution of individual uh, members of the faith community and the registration of the faith community in the country. Now that is not only a problem for the Protestant Christian community, it is, I think, the Ahmadiyya community faces all three issues as well. I think my fellow panelists will speak in more detail about that. Uh, but other faith communities as well. For instance, humanists had uh, several members of their community sentenced to prison sentences uh, in the last few years. Uh, the Baha'i and the Shia are not allowed to register their communities either, and they are not allowed to have places of worship either. So it's across the board of the non-Muslim religious communities that these issues uh, are being faced. Um, as I said before, in the past, when one of these cycles started, there was international pressure and then the government would relent after a while uh, until the next wave would start a few years later. In this particular instant, there has been a lot of international attention and pressure on the Algerian authorities uh, as well. Um, it has been discussed on the ministerial level. Several government ministers, including from the Netherlands, but also other countries, has discussed it with government ministers of the Algerian uh, authorities. Uh, there have been statements from UN special rapporteurs 
on these issues. There have been countless letters that were written by members of parliament from different countries to the Algerian authorities, uh, including from the US Congress, the European Parliament, other places as well. There have been urgency <coughs> resolutions in the European Parliament on this and other efforts as well. Uh, but so far, it has not had the desired effect. Yet, the government is still continuing its crackdown on the non-Muslim religious communities. So, we hope very much, uh, and I believe Sarah will talk a little bit about that later. So, we hope very much that the international community will not uh, uh, lose interest in this country and this important issue, but will continue to uh, raise this issue with the Algerian government and uh, strongly encourage them to make the changes necessary to bring full freedom of religion and belief for all in Algeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this overview of what's happening to the religious minorities in Algeria. Uh, that gives us a good overview of the problems uh, you uh, pictured and now we're a little bit going to zoom into the different uh, religious minorities starting with the Christian Protestant churches. So I'm introducing Mr. Yusuf Uraman who will be speaking to us uh, online, hopefully if it all technically works. I'll introduce him shortly. He is uh, the Vice President of the Association of the Protestant Churches in Algeria and um, he uh, stands up uh, for the people that are uh, put in, uh, in jail, convicted, um, if they are uh, spreading the gospel in Algeria. Because simply it's a human right to sh share your belief and faith. So let's see if it works to introduce Yusuf Uleman to speak to us uh, on what's happening with the Protestant Church. And after Mr. Uleman, uh, his daughter Sarah will also explain a little bit the situation of the Christians in Algeria. First, Yusuf. Right. Well, I hope you can uh, you can hear me now. Are you hearing yes. me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Okay. Right. And <laughs> my English is not as good as my daughter there, Sarah, but anyhow I will try. So uh, I'm glad that, uh, you know, you are doing all what you can to be able to help the church in Algeria. And for me, I have been very surprised because a lot of efforts have been going on since 2018 and of course a lot of pressure, 2019 and so on. But it looks like the Algerian government is really resisting to all the pressure that they are facing. But uh, unfortunately, as I said, at the moment we are back in square zero and uh, we are still struggling with uh, all the same issues, you know, the registration of the church, of the license of the church. We are still facing some harassment. Uh, the report recently, just recently, the, uh, our president, uh, Pastor Salah Shilla, has been calling to the police to investigate about the funding, how the EPA get the funding, who is supporting this uh, church, where the money comes from, etc. So it's a new tactic. And uh, that's, of course, we were expecting it. But even now, we're still facing a lot of harassment and, and persecution. I just want to uh, let you know that one of the Algerian objectives within this persecution, closing down the churches, of course, is to see the Christian community become very weak and somehow disappear, or most of us will disappear, you know, and there will be no church uh, uh, anyhow. So that's one of the main tactics. But of course, you know, we are resisting uh, by all means and continue, of course, to trust the Lord and praying, of course, and meeting in, uh, in a lot of house meetings, etc., and advocating for our case, not just overseas, but also in this country. Unfortunately, it also has a bad effect. A lot of within the churches, of course, being closed and there is no uh, church services, there is no community, there is no pastoral care, there is no teaching. Many of our believers are getting weak, and also sometimes, of course, you know, just, uh, you know, went back to the word, as we say, and that also has a little bit bad effect. I just, I want to see the police just to say hi, you know, to see what's happening. And then, in, in fact, they told me they have been ordered to even uh, watch the, the churches that are meeting in the homes which is this is very new, and uh, so we have to be very careful now in our meetings at home house churches, and as maybe you have heard about the brother Hamid has been convicted because he 
was holding a meeting in his home and he was broadcasting, of course, uh, the meeting. But at the moment, with this, the ordinances of, three, uh, of uh, March 26, 2006, sorry, he can be convicted anytime, anywhere, whatever he can do. Either he can broadcast, you know, a testimony, he can broadcast, a, you know, a, a, a program on YouTube or, 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 a, or a Facebook, he can be in trouble. So, the, what, what, when, what they are trying to, really to do is to make us very scared and afraid and very weak, so we cannot witness, we cannot live our Christian faith, but anyhow, I'm very thankful really to uh, to God, because the church is still alive, still strong, and we have seen a lot of interest within the YouTube, because we broadcast our programs, we take all the risks, and we have seen a lot of interest in the gospel team. So, uh, that's, I think you have mentioned a lot of things which is in, in, in my heart, but I think, you know, one of the things we have been facing recently, I mean, for myself, especially others as well, from the board members of the EPA, we get a lot of harassment. At the, at the Air Force, when we leave or when we come back. That's, of course, it's getting uh, worse and worse every time. So that's also a uh, way that I saw the lawyer, our lawyer that we work with, and he said to me, they can do nothing because this is, this is the government tactics to make you, you know, to make life hard for you, that's all. So that's the insight, <laughs> to make life hard for you. So we don't understand why. I mean, you know, this is, uh, they are trying by all means to make life very hard for us, but anyhow, we are surviving well and we continue, of course, to, to persevere. Of course, our main, of course, uh, need at the moment is to get the license of the ATA renewed. Once it is renewed and recognized, then a lot of things, of course, can change. Then we can tackle other things. But at the moment, we think this is the main issue that we are working and, of course, and praying in. The building all kinds of advocacy and pressure, and that's I think if we have we, we can continue on that to see the the license of the EPA being renewed, and of course uh, it's, it needs a miracle as uh, as uh, our president, you know, at the ministry, uh, the minister of interior, he said that to us that some people, of course, they like us, but some people they they, they, they dislike us, and uh, we think at the moment our fight is in the hand of someone who hate the Christians in Algeria, who want them to disappear, to disappear, who doesn't want this church to exist, because as you know, you know, for the Argentine uh, government, and the Argentine, of course, uh, uh, it's, it's a big shame. It's a big shame for them to see, I'm talking about tens of thousands of Muslim converts. You know, we maybe say about 140, 160,000 ex-Muslims becoming Christians, and they are very active very active, very gifted, and of course there's a lot of openness among the, the, the especially among the Kabili, the Berber community, so that's frightened them very much. We are not, you know, Europeans, we are <laughs> Algerians, and actually 95%, except our children, we are all Muslim converts, all our pastors, our leaders, our Bible teachers, our evangelists, you name it, all, we were all Muslims, and that's the this is for them, is a big problem, is a big, it's a big, uh, has big hassle for them because they get a lot of, you know, uh, what can they say, pressure from the some the Arab countries, of course, and the Muslim communities as well within and outside. But this is our situation. We are not like Egypt or Jordan or Lebanon or whatever you can think of, but we are Algerians coming from Islam, founded many churches actually, and many, many house churches, and the church is very active and growing very fast. And that's actually what frightened the Argentine government. So they always think that we are a problem. They think we are going to disturb, you know, the stability of the country, and we will create, of course, this unity. They might even think, you know, <coughs> think that we are very much linked with all the foreign agencies you can, you can think of. So anyhow, we uh, we continue to persevere, and we say, I would like to say to you a big thank you really for all the efforts you are doing and you have been doing as well. And we have decided in our recent actually EPA board meeting that we will never give up and we will not give up. We will continue to persevere till one day we will get all our freedom to be recognized in this land of our area. So thank you, but also I would like to uh, let you know that our Zen Church is not thinking only of our area, but we have a vision, we have plans, we have strategy to send out many Argentines out to be missionaries, to reach out to the Muslims. You know, like we have now missionaries in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Tunisia, and that's actually what frightened more the rest of the Arab world, because they see that as, as a threat. 
not just for Algeria, but also other parts of the Muslim country. So, anyhow, I will stop here, and uh, if we're very happy to answer your questions, then throw on. And of course, my daughter will do it, so thank you much for what I did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have sound. Oh, wait, yeah, we have sound. Thank you, Yusuf, for sharing your story. You are an Algerian, so you were living um, the freedom of religion in Algeria, so you know the situation by heart and by head. And uh, good to hear your perseverance as a Christian, uh, that you keep the faith uh, despite all the uh, oppression that you face. So that's encouraging. And uh, no, you're not alone. We're, uh, we're uh, supporting you, as well as the Ahmadi and the other religion, majority, minorities. And uh, so uh, we pray for you, and uh, we'll keep supporting you. And we go on to the next generation, I would uh, nearly say, uh, Sarah, his daughter. Uh, she has a master in anthropology, and she did also a research. Uh, and she studied uh, religious minorities in Egypt and also in Algeria. So, Good to have you live with us, Sarah. To you, the floor. Thank you. Hello? All off switch. Oh. Hello? Great. Good morning. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you to Jubilee Campaign, Middle East Concern, and all of the other partners and speakers and representatives who have joined forces to organize this session. I'm humbled that we can come here together and hear and act on furthering freedoms of worship and belief in Algeria. Um, the Algerian Evangelical Church is an important space and a, a community in which I grew up. My parents would oftentimes take me to churches, lengthy, lengthy church services, and I wasn't too pleased about that when I was younger. But as the years have gone by, I've come to really cherish this important experience. Not only is the Algerian church an important space and an important community, but arguably, during the 1990s, it provided some sort of a refuge for Algerian Christians and a home during a time of a real gruesome time in Algerian history. In the church, Christians would meet together, worship together for hours on end, and ate together. And as a child, I actually spent a lot of my formative years growing up in this space. And it's where I met some of my oldest and like-minded friends. And so, for me, then, to grow up in this context of the church in Algeria is a treasure, but unfortunately a luxury that most young Algerians don't have today. The Constitution sets out specific four protections. At Article 51, freedom of conscience and freedom of opinion shall be inviolable. <coughs> freedom of worship shall be guaranteed and exercised without discrimination in compliance with the law. The state shall impartially guarantee the protection of places of worship, too. Algeria is a signatory of the Inter International Convent of civil and political rights, and yet the authorities increasingly violated four protections. Open Doors organization in 2019 labeled the Christian persecution in Algeria as a systematic campaign against Christians. It's beyond a lack of religion, freedom of religion or belief. The Algerian authorities are engaging in an active and extensive plan to get rid of Christian churches and restrict the religious, socioeconomic freedoms and even civil liberties of Algerian Christians all across the country, both individually and as a community. I believe the more recent statistic is that currently 19 Protestant churches have been sealed. Church leaders faced heightened targeting and prosecution in criminal courts on four related charges such as blasphemy, proselytizing, staging worship without a license, since those same authorities continue to deny those said licenses. But also, for an example, an Algerian couple who wanted to start up a nursery, and they invested much of their own personal money in a town called Tizuzu, were not allowed to set up their nursery because they were Christians. Meanwhile, my parents have had their church closed, and seven of their daughter churches closed, and also a private residence. It is the only pastor's house that has been sealed out of the 19 churches that have been closed. I'd like to pose the question, what does this point this to in the future of Algeria? Circling back to my earlier points, for the younger generations of Algerian Christians, or Algerians, what does it mean to grow up in a community that is actively being told to be quiet, to disperse, and to be told that they should cease to exist, sometimes even by violent means? When freedom of religion and belief goes, so does many other fundamental human rights too. And our human rights are under attack. It's being denied and arguably 
the whole Algerian society suffers. I call on you to safeguard religious institutions, religious communities such as Christians in Algeria and oppressed minorities, to support religious leaders and to stand with us in advocating religious freedom in Algeria. To close, I'd like to thank you for listening and plead that you stand with us to advocate seven claims if there's time to go through them. Um, for churches to be opened and also private Christian residences such as my parents's, for the Evangelical Protestant Association license to be renewed, to amend or repeal the anti-proselytism laws via the ordinance of March 2006, Article 11.1, to permit the, important, the importation of Christian material and other materials, and to allow Algerian Christians to marry other Christians from foreign countries, to grant churches building permissions, to issue visas for overseas teachers and pastors to train and equip the Evangelical Protestant Association churches. And finally, we ask you that you help us to advocate the license of the Biblical Society, Algerian Christian Books Association based in Algiers. Lengthy, but thank you. And please come find me afterwards if you want to speak more on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for these uh, recommendations as well. Seven recommendations. So we'll we'll put them somewhere on the on our website and uh, we'll we'll share them because they're very concrete uh, recommendations. Now we'll zoom into the Ahmadi community, the Ahmadi Muslim community. So I'll introduce uh, Amiat Khan, um, who is yes here as a guest speaker and. Uh, let me just mention um, what he's doing. He currently serves as the National Secretary for Public Affairs of Ahmadiyya Muslim Community in the U.S. and President of Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyers Association in the U.S. And additionally, Mr. Khan is also co-founder of Global Lawyers for Refugees and is on the board of the Humanity First USA. And today, he's specifically speaking regarding the persecution of Ahmadiyya Muslims in Algeria. Uh, Mr. Khan, to you the floor. Well, thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, it is really an honor and privilege to be here in this side event uh, connected to a very important ministerial that's happening just a, a, a little ways away. Um, I wanted to thank the Jubilee Campaign and all of the sponsoring organizations of this very important program. Um, I am uh, privileged to be here to speak about an issue that perhaps may be less known but incredibly important to not just the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, but for all communities in Algeria and beyond Algeria as well. Um, at the outset, I have to say, um, I, I teach and practice law in Los Angeles at UCLA, and uh, I am Muslim, I'm an Ahmadi Muslim, and in hearing the, the testimony that I just heard, it deeply pains me as a Muslim to know that in the name of Islam, there would be such intolerance being committed. It is completely against the teachings of Islam, completely against the teachings of Islam to not allow the full and free exercise of religion and belief for all communities, and particularly the Christian community, whom the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, welcomed in his church in Najran who wrote a charter of privileges for Christians, that in the name of Islam, there would be such intolerance being committed. It is completely ghastly. It must be decried by all Muslims in the world. And I will say very categorically that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community condemns this persecution against the Christian community. And we stand in complete solidarity with all persecuted Christians, including those who are represented today. I say that because it's very important we don't forget the bigger picture, that all people of faith, especially these great Abrahamic faiths, must recognize the importance of not just freedom of religion for Christians, but I will go so far as to say the protection of our Christian brothers and sisters. And as, the, as, an, as a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and as someone who knows very well the teachings of the founder of our community, it's very critical that we must protect Christian churches wherever they are. This is actually a commandment by God in the Quran to protect churches. And so for churches to be sealed in a Muslim country is shocking. 
and it should never happen in any Muslim country. With respect to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the community has had a presence in Algeria since the 1920s, in fact. And really, this persecution that the community is enduring is a new phenomenon just in the past several years. I should say at the outset that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community professes to be Muslim, but in some parts of the Muslim world are declared to be non-Muslim. In Pakistan, the constitution of the country declares the entire community to be non-Muslim, and that's a punishable offense if we claim to be Muslim. In Algeria, we had enjoyed religious freedom for a long time. When there came a point when 2,000 Ahmadis, had, the, the, the congregation had grown to 2,000 Algerian Ahmadis, the Ahmadiyya community in Buleda decided to apply for a registration to have a mosque. And this was the precipitating event that led to the state very aggressively reacting to that rather perfunctory act that we felt. And immediately that permit was denied. And in fact, worse than that, the building that was secured by the Ahmadiyya community was destroyed by the state. This happened in February of 2016. And then thereafter, Ahmadi sought to be registered as an organization. Now, it is really interesting for a community that believes to be Muslim to want to seek to register a mosque. But unfortunately, Algeria does not recognize the great diversity in Islam, the great diversity among Muslims. And there are more than 72 different sects of Islam. Ahmadis doctrinally follow the Hanafi school. It's ironic that Ahmadis are quite orthodox as Muslim, observing all the Muslim practices and Islamic practices, yet nevertheless are viewed as deviant, as outside the pale of Islam. So this was the event that led to the Minister of Interior very much not just rejecting the application, but then going on a specific uh, um, uh, pronouncements saying that the Ahmadis can never enjoy religious freedom in their country. In fact, uh, for the interest of time, I'll just mention one statement which is a microcosm of how the state is reacting to Ahmadis. In October of 2016, the religious affairs minister referred to the Ahmadis trying to just get a mosque of their own for their 2000 as, quote, deliberate sectarian invasion of the country, uh, deviation from Islam. And then the, in, in, in that same year, then uh, the chief of the, of the cabinet to the president of the country said that in the matter of Ahmadis, quote, there are no human rights or freedom of religion. And he called on all Algerians to protect the country from Shia and Ahmadiyya sects. So these were public statements. These were not private overtures. These were things that were covered, well covered. And of course, we know that this is, stands against Algerians' legal commitments. One of the rare, I would say, when I, as, as someone who studied the constitutions of Muslim countries, it's very rare for a Muslim country to have acceded to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the most important human rights covenant in the world. And Algeria has acceded to it, in fact, signaling their intent that they want to be different from other Muslim countries that persecute, yet completely in contradiction of their international legal obligations, not just destroying houses of worship for the Protestants and, and other Christian denominations, but also not even allowing a mosque to be built for the Ahmadiyya community. I'll say here as well that there, in summary, what has happened for the Ahmadiyya community is not just that, that registration and not just the inability to build a mosque, but actually there has been legal prosecution. And this is really disturbing. 292 Ahmadis have been prosecuted over the past several years. The Supreme Court has before it or has already decided 280 cases against Ahmadis since 2016. Uh, 26 Ahmadis have been jailed. The jail sentences are from two to seven months. There is an Ahmadi that's currently in jail in Adrar. There was one that was released last year. And what is happening is a cycle of intimidation, 
which leads to prosecution, maybe release and then re-arresting and destroying the lives of mothers and children, ripping families apart. I have spoken to these Ahmadis myself. I have spent time speaking to Ahmadi women who cannot, who do not know where, when their spouses will return home, will not know when the next Ahmadi will be arrested. Their children who are crying, not knowing when their fathers will be returned. Mothers being prosecuted, women, Ahmadi women being prosecuted. We have here an Ahmadi Algerian, Tamal, who's, who's in solidarity with this event here. Um, and he specifically came because of the pain that he's expressing on behalf of Algerians, Ahmadi Algerians. The nature of the offenses is important to note. And um, in the interest of time, I'll just very briefly uh, summarize that Ahmadis uh, are, are facing the kind of prosecution that deals with uh, offenses that are really surprising. You know, this idea of not being able to associate, to commit blasphemy, possession of documents, you know, these are not, these are offenses like if an Ahmadi possesses a Quran, that's an offense. If an Ahmadi recites the Quran, that's an offense. If they're exchanging documents over WhatsApp, those could be offenses. The, the, the triviality of these offenses is very disturbing. And the use of law has been weaponized in Algeria. In the interest of time, I will just say that this spans all major <clears throat> cities in Algeria. TCO Su, we've had many Ahmadis who've been prosecuted. Constantine, I mentioned about um, uh, Buleda in Kenchala and Batna. There's so many places where Ahmadis are being prosecuted. In conclusion here, I will say the following. As someone who uh, really believes in the rule of law, it's very important that Algeria recognizes its commitment to its own constitution, which protects freedom of religion. We are not asking for any special favors for any community who is not Muslim or is a minority in Algeria. We're asking for justice based on their own constitution. These are not special favors of the government. These are cherished rights that everyone must enjoy. And this December 2020 change in the constitution, as was mentioned earlier, is disturbing because it does not recognize the ability for freedom of association for all communities. It only recognizes it for some. I will say here the, the real irony and tragedy that I personally as an Amity must convey here in the end is I think we're almost on the anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, of the 60th anniversary of Algeria being admitted to the United Nations. I believe that was on October 9th, 1962. And that was a very historic day for Algeria with the green and white flag being raised in the UN. Perhaps some, even in Algeria, may not know that the person who raised that flag was an Ahmadi Muslim. He was the president of the United Nations at the time, General Assembly, Sir Zafrullah Khan, an Ahmadi who fought for the independence of Algeria as a nation, who was heralded as someone who was a, a, a major supporter of the country, and he's an Ahmadi. And now, so many decades later, Ahmadis are in jail presently when their own people have fought so hard and loved so much their country. We cannot stand for this in 2022. We as a religious community must decry this and restore Algeria to the freedom of religion that is necessary for it to shine and to restore its luster, which was the birth of its presence at the UN, and make sure they abide by those commitments of the ICCPR. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for this, um, yeah impressive and emotional uh, view on uh, the Ahmadis and how they're treated. I didn't know that it was so bad, as you described, where there are uh, 292 people are uh, convicted and in, in prison uh, because of their faith. So it's good you stress this uh, situation, uh, problematic situation of the Ahmadi in Algeria. We'll continue to the next speaker, Barristan Paul Diamond, on the table as well, and he is uh, one of the leading experts on law of religion, religious liberty and freedom, including specialized areas such as ethical and social conscience, 
and he is a well-known speaker to also the EU, the European Parliament in Brussels and Strasbourg, and also to the international courts. So we're honored to have you here, Mr. Diamond, and he, is, uh, he has served as well on the Standing Committee or Council uh, to the Christian Legal Center, a sister organization of Christian Concerned. And uh, so we'll, we'll hope for hear from you more on the legal side on the situation in Algeria. To you, the floor. Well, actually, I, I feel a bit um, um, limited what I could say. Most of the speakers have covered many of the issues. So I think I've slightly readopted my approach. I'm just going to do a general summary um, where I feel there are certain issues that can be addressed. There's, there's a number of sort of the speakers have covered most of the issues, church closures, in, un, um, impartial applications of the law, um, discrimination, a lack of general freedom and a whole range in, in weaponizing the law. I think what we can see is a number of repeated themes. Um, we've got um, the issue of converts from Islam. That's always been extremely problematic, people leaving Islam. Um, um, and um, apostasy in Islam and the schools of thought. We've also got the issue is who is recognized as a Muslim group. Um, the Ahmadians have got this perpetual problem from Pakistan to Algeria. We've got discriminatory laws. The law themselves are discriminatory. The law says you cannot convert a Muslim. It doesn't say you can't convert a Christian. The law says you, or you can't convert an, an Ahmadian. Thank you. Um, it says that um, you should not uh, convert a Muslim, and, the, and of course the laws are very general. We've got the threat of radical Islam, the Islamists who are opposed to um, any deviance from Sharia law, and people who, people who convert from Islam or deviate uh, from the traditional path of Islam often that threat from their family members as much as anybody else. They are in a very precarious situation and very often have to conceal their faith or, or um, disguise their true motives. Some even have to flee, no doubt. And, and um, the Ahmadian faith and no doubt Christianity are seen as a threat to the Islamic society and are worthy of supervision by the intelligence and security forces. Now, that is a, a specific issue. It's not wholly unknown in Europe. The use of administrative procedures, health and safety, closing buildings, requirements of registration, um, uh, bodies that never issue any permits or bodies that never give any land. Many of these um, issues are well known um, in the European Court. There's been many cases in the European Court where uh, countries have used registration requirements to deny. Across the European zone, often it's the Jehovah Witnesses who suffer most of this. And the European Court strikes these down. Um, it's not so easy. Other courts, are denied, other churches and religious organisations are denied legal personality. Uh, there's a very famous case in Greece and they just said all bodies have a right to legal personality. Governments come up with crazy arguments. The Salvation Army in Russia were identified as a paramilitary force seeking to undermine the Russian state because they were known as the Salvation Army with a military structure. So we have all these patterns and they're not unique, well, to Algeria. A lot of countries in the world use these techniques and it's actually, on one level, fairly old hat. There's a lot of mechanisms dealing with it. I think in summary, I want to just say two things. The first thing is, um, one of the documents that I looked at before I spoke today was a document called the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam. And of course that's a document from the Organization of Islamic States and it's considered one of the main documents on the interpretation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And I just jotted down Article 10, 
Islam is the religion of the true, of true unspoilt nature. It is prohibited to exercise any form of pressure on man or to exploit his poverty or ignorance in order to force him to change his religion to another religion or to atheism. And Article 22 preserves freedom of expression provided it is not contrary to the Sharia. Um, that gives you a sort of flavour, no doubt, of the sort of circumstances in many countries that adhere to that declaration. I think all I can end with is some of my experience. You have to keep fighting. I know you are keeping fighting. You have to push in the local courts in Algeria. You have to push in the international forums. You have to keep going forward. And very often, you've got to have a long-term strategy. This, you're not going to get a knockout blow from the, the Algerian Supreme Court. You have freedom. That will not happen realistically. But what will happen is over five, ten years, you chip and chip away, and you keep the pressure on, and you try and change the social and legal culture. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honour to be here. Thank you, uh, Paul, for sharing uh, your last words of hope. Uh, and it will not take one day, but probably more years, maybe 10 years, to chop off, as you said, the sharp sides of the law um, in these countries. Well, that's what we're here for. Uh, we together uh, believe that we can make a little difference, take little steps um, to protect religious freedom in the world, and especially as we talked about Algeria. So thank you very much, all the speakers. And I'm looking at the clock. It's already time to close. Um, we'll put up the seven recommendations of Sarah that were very helpful. We'll, um, of course, bring in our hearts the, the emotional plea of Mr. Khan on the Ahmadis. And we heard uh, Yusuf talk about the Protestant alliance there, uh, which have a difficulty in getting his license extended. So it's a lot of um, food for thought and uh, action points to take home. So that's uh, these last words where I want to close this session. Thank you very much for um, being here and sharing your knowledge and experience of Algeria. So thank you very much on behalf of Jubilee Campaign.